okay? Comes from the fourth chapter of Luke's gospel, the first 13 verses. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was the first Monday in Lent, and a man decided this is the day I start my new life. His doctor had said, you really are pre-diabetic at this point. You've put on so much weight during the last few years, and he said, you have a family history of heart disease. It is time to make some changes. And the man said, all right, I'm going to start Monday. Monday came, first Monday in Lent. And he was driving to work, and he passed Krispy Kreme donuts, and the red light came on. I don't know what it means when the red light comes on at Krispy Kreme donuts. Some of you are afraid to say that you know what it means. It means that the donuts are hot and fresh. And he said, Lord, what am I to do? What am I to do? I said I was going to start my new diet today. But the red light just came on, Lord. It means they're hot and they're fresh. Wouldn't the people in my office just be so happy if I brought in some donuts, and I could only eat one. I, I know I could just eat one. So he said, Lord, I'm going to leave it up to you. I'm going to get off the highway, and if there is a parking space outside the door, I will know that you want me to have a donut and get donuts for the office. So he got off the highway, and about an hour later, he showed up at the office with three dozen donuts. He took three for his desk and left the rest for his coworkers, and somebody said, I'm not trying to be judgmental here, but didn't you say you were going to turn over a new leaf today and start your, your new diet, your new way of life for Lent? The man said, yes, but you see, God wanted me to have these because I asked the Lord, if you want me to stop and get donuts, you will make a parking space right outside the door. He said, and four times around Krispy Kreme, and sure enough, there was an empty parking space. <laughs> it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. What's that the opening line of? That's the opening line of a novel? Tale of Two Cities. We have a tale of two temptations today, don't we? Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus in the wilderness. You couldn't picture two more different scenes, could you? What's the garden like? Shut your eyes for a moment and picture the Garden of Eden. Lush, green, flowing water that's crystal clear. Everything you could want or even imagine wanting. Everything you could hope for right there at your fingertips. All created for you. You were raised up from the dust of the earth because God's spirit entered you and you became human. And you had everything you could want except one thing, God said. I'm going to put a tree there. You can have everything you want. You can eat of all these trees. Just not that one. Then you have Jesus in the desert. Picture the desert for a moment. It can be beautiful, but it can be hostile. It can be filled with all sorts of critters that are dangerous. Um, I had a mission team that went to do Katrina relief in one of my churches, and people were getting stung at night. They thought there were bees in their sleeping bags, so they emptied them out in the morning. You know what? They had scorpions, little bitty scorpions, stinging them during the night. The scorpions in the desert are bigger than that and more deadly, and there are snakes, and there are rocks, and not much water. Jesus is there 40 days and 40 nights and doesn't eat in that whole time. A tale of two cities, definitely, and two different temptation stories. Now, we didn't read the whole temptation account from Adam and Eve, but you know it, right? She gives the fruit to her husband, and he says, no woman, uh-uh, 
God said no, right? That's what happened, right? Just ask any man here. That's what happened, right? The man said, no, 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 no. God said, no, I'm not going to do it. No, what did he do? He took it, he ate it. God comes along and says, what have you done? What does Adam say? It was that woman, the one you gave me. You gave her to me. She made me eat. What does she say? Well, me is that serpent. We're buck passers, aren't we? That's a great sin, isn't it? The sin of passing the buck, blaming somebody else for what we've decided to do. You know the story. They're sent from the garden to make their way in the world. He's going to have to toil for his food. She's going to have to have pain in bearing children. But God's love will continue to follow them. Then you have Jesus in the desert, who is offered more than we could ever imagine in a place of great deprivation and want. I don't know about you, but if I went 40 days and 40 nights without eating, I would say, turn it to bread. I could turn that stone to chocolate, Liberian chocolate maybe even, or better yet, the brownies that Gail makes from the Liberian chocolate, best brownies of all time perhaps. But Jesus says no. Why would he say no to that? You know, if you are the son of God, well, he knew who he was. Because this is Luke's gospel. And who took him into the wilderness but the spirit? The same spirit that was breathed into that clay to make man and woman, to bear God's image in the world. The spirit takes Jesus from the time of his baptism where the spirit had descended on him in bodily form as he prayed and sends him into this place where he's going to be tested. If you are the son of God, well, sure he's the son of God. But he will not do it. And the devil ups the ante, right? Because what would you want more than food? How about control and dominion over all things? And we see where that is still a problem in the world today, isn't it? This very week, Vladimir Putin has decided he needs to have complete control over people in another nation, a sovereign nation. He needs to control them even if he has to destroy them to do it. That kind of power can be very tempting, can it? Even on a smaller level, people when they have power over their own family sometimes abuse it. Or anybody here never had a boss who was just a little bit power hungry maybe? A little bit? A little crazy? But even that will not tempt Jesus to stray from his mission and what he's come to do. And then that last temptation where he's taken to the pinnacle of the temple and said, if you're God's son, jump. You know nothing's going to happen to you. God would not let that happen. Show us who you are. Show us who your father is. Show us his ability to redeem and save you if you jump off the temple. You know. And what does this Satan do at that point? He quotes scripture, because how has Jesus managed to stand up against temptation? He knows his Bible, and he is able to draw on God's word. This time the devil says, isn't it written that nothing will happen to you? You won't even, if you fall, you won't even bruise your foot on a stone. And Jesus says to him, no, don't test the Lord your God. And the devil leaves till an opportune time, and we are here to begin that journey toward that opportune time. It would be easy just to say, this is a scripture that says, read your Bible and you won't be tempted. But we know that's not true. That's not what this is about. This is the beginning of Lent for us. We read this story every year, the first Sunday of Lent, because what it says to us is there is nothing, nothing, nothing that Jesus will not do to get back to us, to get us back to God. Jesus will come to us regardless of the pain it causes him, regardless of what he has asked to give up, even to the point of giving his own life for our sake and the sake of the world. He will do that. That's the difference between self-serving and self-giving. Self-serving is caring for yourself above all else. Self-giving is what Christ has done for the world. I sometimes hesitate to use the language of a Lenten journey because we're walking a way that we don't have to walk. We're walking in a way to follow Christ, recommitting ourselves, it's like re-upping in the military, right? You get to the point where you think, I only have a couple months left, but nope, I think I'm going to sign on for more. That's what Lent does for us. It readjusts us. It reorients us to the faith that makes us whole. 
often say that if you want to give up something for Lent, if it brings you closer to God, do it. But if it just makes you focus on your own wants and needs, then forget about it. But I always encourage people to take up during Lent. The practices of Lent, almsgiving, giving particularly to the poor of the world. And right now, that is absolutely necessary. We are facing a humanitarian crisis unlike any other we've experienced probably since World War II. Already a million and a half displaced Ukrainians are at the borders of other nations seeking refuge. The estimate is by the time it's over, five million Ukrainians will be needing a home and sustenance. I cannot imagine what they're going through because they're like us, very middle class suburban families who now have no place to live. I was amazed because I was out with the little kids the other day when they were getting picked up at the ECC. There was a little girl on the news that had exactly the same backpack, jacket, and hat as one of our kids here. So almsgiving is a way to bring yourself closer to God and Jesus Christ and his will for humanity in the world today. And there's prayer. Prayer that is deeper than just, now I lay me down to sleep, or what do we say before we eat? You all have one of your little prayers that you say with your kids at night? What were some of those that you prayed when you were children? Say that again louder. Very good. What are some of the others that we've said growing up? Amen. You know those. But what if we were to pray more deeply? God, move me to share all that you've given me. God, thank you for this day, for this bread. Because Jesus taught us how to pray, didn't he? He said, give us this day our daily bread. Don't give me enough to get me through the next 40 days and nights. Give me enough for today. I will be satisfied with that. Lord, help me to share what I have, the bread on my table, the love in my heart, the forgiving grace that only you can provide. You've taught me how, Lord. Let me do it now through you. Prayer and almsgiving and fasting. If you're going to fast from something, don't fast from chocolate. It's not going to get you closer to Jesus. Fast from getting yourself so wound up in traffic that you scream at somebody like I did this morning. I want to tell you the truth. I was praying. I was praying, and somebody came running up behind me, and I was like, what the heck? Do you think you're doing? Get off my bumper, you nonsensical person. Yeah, it can come up on us, can it? Because temptation doesn't look like a snake, does it? Because I'd have no trouble at all saying no to a snake. Temptation looks like chocolate sometimes. More often it looks like returning a harsh word for an unkind phrase. More often it looks like trying to hold on to things that God wants me to let go of like resentment and anger and bitterness. Sometimes it just looks like getting my own way. It would be nice just to say, if you read the Bible and you won't be tempted. We know that's not true because we're human. We're like Adam and Eve. We're buck pastors like Adam and Eve, aren't we? And yet God loves us. We're going to share communion, which is a wonderful thing to do on the first Sunday in Lent. And in churches I've served before, I have served communion every Sunday during Lent. Some people say, why do we need it so often? Because we need it every day. John Wesley believed that every time Christians gather, we should share it together in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ to strengthen ourselves for the week that lies ahead. But even those other Anglicans, because he was an Anglican priest, he was not a Methodist, never was a Methodist. They would line up and spit on them as they went into the chapel and call them Papists because of their practice and their devotion to Holy Communion. But he believed every time we gather, we should share in the meal that makes us whole. This morning, we're going to share in that meal. Every single time I serve communion, I've told you before, I am so reminded of the communion of saints. I'm reminded of the grandfather that I never knew who's at the table with me, the grandparents I knew who were at the table with me, the husband I loved who's at the table with me. I'm reminded of the people around the world who are with me then. The people in Ukraine this morning are gathering where they can and cel celebrating the presence of God in Holy Communion. 
we're united with them. When Anna and Nathan go back to Liberia, when we share at the table, we're at the table with them. We're at the table with people of all times and places. We're at the table long ago with Jesus at his last supper with his disciples, but we're also at the kingdom of heaven at the banquet that never ends. And I'm reminded every time I share the body and blood of Christ that this is the same meal he shared with those knowing full well that they were about to deny him, betray him, and desert him. People who knew him best who witnessed his miracles because temptation to flee sometimes is the strongest of all. And yet, here he is with us now. So I hope your journey of Lent is one that takes you to that place where Christ reveals himself to you most clearly. I pray for you the time when you can look at the cross of Jesus Christ, not just to see the destruction of our Lord, but to see the love of God, because that's what this story is about, the love of God that does not give up on us, that does not quit, that reaches through our sinfulness and our brokenness and our shame to reclaim us and make us whole. And then you will know an Easter like no other. But as we enter Lent, do not forget where we're headed. We've had a lot of Lent lately. I said that the other day. I said that on Ash Wednesday. I said it last Sunday too. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of tired of Lent. Because it was nearly two years ago, next week it will be two years exactly, since we stopped meeting regularly and everything that we knew seemed very strange to us again. March 16th. 2020 was the last day we worshiped before everything went haywire. But God saw us through, and God will continue to see us through. God will bring us together and strengthen us. God's going to re-equip this congregation to reach out in love and concern to the world. We're going to reignite our passion for doing the work of God. We're going to reach out in mission. We're going to reach out in love and service. We're going to Find where there is need, and we're going to be there in the name of Jesus Christ because of Easter. And we're going to live Easter every day, even as we stand in front of his cross and see the depth of his love there for us. Now, if you can't resist a Krispy Kreme now and then, go for it. You know, unless you do have diabetes or a heart condition, then moderation is a good thing, right? But whatever you do, don't give up your faith in God. Don't give up your ability to forgive. Don't give up on your neighbors and your friends and those who disappoint you and break your hearts because God did not give up on you. And God in Christ never will. I changed the words to our sending forth because there are words that a little bit more reveal what I think the truth is. It says, the way the words are printed in the hymnal of the old spiritual is, we must walk this lonesome valley. We have to walk it by ourselves. I couldn't write that because we don't walk it by ourselves, do we? We walk it in the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. He's the one who leads us through. So the words this morning are a little different. We must choose to walk this valley. We have to choose it for ourselves. Though nobody else can make us follow, we have to choose it for ourselves. May God give each of us the grace to follow wherever we are led, Trusting in God's grace, knowing that we are loved beyond our ability to comprehend, knowing that in Christ we've been given all things, and in Christ we will be made new. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.